Good morning. Welcome to Garfield Memorial Church. A special welcome to those worshiping online and to our first time guests and visitors. As we close out the month of October, driving in this morning with the sun in my eyes, I thought, well, people in Cleveland complain about the weather, but we really have nothing to complain about now. It's absolutely splendid. Wonderful way to end the month. Now, please stand and join me in the call to worship that will be followed by hymn number 402. Glorious God, shine upon us with your spirit of wisdom and truth. Enlighten our hearts. Help us to know the hope to which we are called. Reveal your ways that we might share hope and joy in all that we do and all that we say. Amen. may be seated. I am not Pastor Scott Glevins, as it says in your bulletin. I'm Terry McHugh, part of the pastoral team, and as we gather, we get to pray with and for one another, and I'll give you an opportunity in a minute to stand and share a way that we can pray or celebrate. If you're worshiping online and there's a way we can pray with you, simply email prayer at garfieldchurch.org and our house of prayer will play, pray confidentially for your needs. But it is our privilege as the body of Christ to be in this together. So how can we pray today? Here. My name is Frances Blount, and I'm asking for prayer for a friend of mine, Karen Byron Johnson, who is the principal of Digital Tech High School in downtown Cleveland. Uh, I'm sure you read or heard on the news about the 15-year-old girl who was shot and dead in the back of a car on Friday night. Uh, this is one of her students, and she just found out from her close relationship with the detectives who have been uh, very closed-mouthed about the whole thing that the murderer is also a student at that school. And this was a, is a school that uh, where Scott uh, had a young lady that was shot um, over a year ago as she was uh, going to work for the first day and was critically injured. So please uh, pray for Karen Byron Johnson, the principal and the teachers at that school because tomorrow is going to be a rough day. Are there other ways we can pray? 
Let's turn to God. Lord, you know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. As we come, we come full of so many things. Grief and fear, joy and hope. Lord, bind us together. Lift up um, those things that are in our hearts and help us to draw closer to you. Thank you that we can come to you as our Abba, Father as children coming to a loving parent when we don't understand why things happen. We don't understand what's going on so often. But nonetheless, we can draw to you and be comforted by you. We say, come Holy Spirit, fill this place, fill us, that we might be empowered to do the ministry that you've called all of us to, to connect diverse people who share a common brokenness with Jesus. Help us to widen the circle, to open our hearts and open our arms to those in need. Help us to live faithfully, day by day, whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. Forgive us for the many times we turn away and seem to forget about you. Thank you for the grace that welcomes us back. Thank you for the grace that continues to help us to be formed into your likeness. What an amazing thing that you offer us the chance to be transformed bit by bit into the image of Christ. Thank you for this body, for the love which you have given us for one another, and for the mission that we share as we get to be your church. And we represent our unity in you as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's a time in our worship, our offering. It's an opportunity for us to give to God what he's so generously given to us. And as we offer not only our gifts of our resources, but also ourselves. The offering is a time when we can recommit ourselves to Christ and to our, the ministry that we share. So we invite you to give. Our ushers, if you're worshiping here in person, will be coming around with the offering plates. If you're worshiping online you can give electronically if you're worshiping in the sanctuary you can give on our website barfieldchurch.org slash giving or by text or by the shelby giving app all that information is in your bulletin so thank you for all you give and that you help to move the mission all the things that we do and a few things on the back of your bulletin the cafe is now open in our main lobby they have a limited menu with specially priced drinks today and then next week will be a full menu uh, the cafe crew has a lot of fun out there, and they're always looking for volunteers, or if you have a secret desire to be a barista, this is your chance. They will train you, and you probably get to sample the drinks. Anyhow, um, and we also have a new session of one of our on-ramps called Connect. This is a way that if you want to join Garfield Church or find out what membership is about, it's a five-week small group, starts November 15th. I will be leading it. And it's a, it's a wonderful way to get to know others and also to learn more about Barfield and see how to get connected. So we hope you will um, consider that if you haven't been through that, whether you've been here a short time or a long time. Uh, we'd love to have you there. Let's continue to worship God by the giving of our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
Never did I think that he was so nigh, bless my soul and gone. He spoke and he made me laugh and cry, bless my soul and gone. My good Lord's done been here, bless my soul and gone away. My good Lord's done been here, bless my soul and gone. Sin a better man, how you walk on the cross, bless my soul and gone. Your foot might slip and your soul get lost, bless my soul and gone. My good Lord's done been here, bless my soul and gone away. My good Lord's done been here, bless my soul and gone. My good Lord's done been here, bless my soul and gone away. Bless my soul and gone away. He bless my soul, bless my soul. He bless my soul and gone. and use them for your work and your world to build your kingdom and help us to be kingdom builders alongside. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture reading this morning is Ephesians 1, 11 to 16, and you can find it printed in your bulletin. In Christ, we've also obtained an inheritance having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who are the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you, as I remember you in my prayers. This 
So let's jump in. We're in the book of Ephesians, a letter really from Paul. We talked last week that Ephesians is very different than Paul's other letters. That's caused some, I mentioned last week, to question whether Paul really wrote it. Pastor Scott and I were digging into this together, and we're both of the school that we really believe there's too much of Paul in this letter. But there are differences. As I said last week, most of Paul's letters, <clears throat> he's writing to a particular issue in the church either a conflict or a controversy or something they need encouragement for, taking up an offering uh, after uh, natural disasters. Paul is addressing something, and we know that historical context, and then we can glean um, truth from that for all contexts. But Ephesians, there's no historical context. He's not addressing anything specifically. And he's writing what we're calling a blueprint for what the church is. Now, the church is always individually and collective. We live individually as part of Christ's church, members of the body, right? But still part of the body. And last week I shared when Paul was talking about God's plan, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the words for plan in the Greek that he uses is the word belio in the Greek, which literally means blueprint. And so Paul is giving a blueprint for what the church really is. And we're coming through <clears throat> the American church and our church Leave my throat, I repeat to you. Um, <clears throat> we're it didn't work. <clears throat> Thanks, Lord. Um, but we're coming through a time of, of disruption, and as I shared, you know, the, the message of the church never changes. The message of the gospel 
never changes the methods always do so some of you worshiping with us online didn't dream four years ago i'd be in a routine of worshiping online that's just the methods changing but not the message so we thought it was really important in this season um, as we're building again um, to look at what does Paul say the spiritual architectural drawings are for the church? And so I've been stuck in Ephesians 1. We can't get out of it. We're in, in four weeks, and you're probably saying, good Lord, are we going to be doing this till Easter? Uh, no, we aren't. But Paul lays down so much important foundation that I don't think we can even go out into the hows and the whats until we know the why. And last week we talked about Paul gave this 202 word sentence right uh, that we that we can't translate into English as one sentence but it was for him a very foundational sentence and I shared that the subject of that sentence is always God and the predicate of that sentence is God has a plan and God's plan is being worked out in history and we're all part of God's plan and the church is part of God's plan but these next verses that David read for us today if you want to flip them over and hold them I'm going to refer to them but to me, <coughs> excuse me, um, to me, I started to realize that what Paul is describing here in these few short verses is what it literally means to be a Christian, what it means to be a follower of Christ. Now, I prayed this morning because I'm in kind of deep water. You know, you get up here and say, well, I'm going to tell you what it means to be a Christian. You sometimes shouldn't trust people like that. So take this for what it's worth. <clears throat> I'm digging into what I believe Paul is telling us. And I think this is very relevant right now. Because if you know younger generations, especially millennials, that's why we're just so blessed right now. All these newer families that are coming to our church are so young. And our Kids Space Theater is just full right now at 10 o'clock, and it's a blessing. And that's very different because our younger generations have been fleeing the church in the last decade because they don't not sure they trust the church very much. Doesn't seem a lot like Jesus. There's political issues going on. We're still dealing with ethnic segregation, let alone uh, the, the pandemic and other things. And, and younger generations are questioning. And, and so I think it's a very relevant question. What does it literally mean to be a Christian, be a Christ follower, to be a follower of Jesus Christ? And so I'm going to hit you with some theological terms this morning. And I'll try to flush them out a little bit, but I hope that they won't just be churchy words for you in the next 20 minutes or so, but they'll find a root in your heart. Paul says that being a Christian is really four things. Truth and gospel, hope and glory. Truth and gospel, hope and glory. Paul said, if you read that verse 12, he said, you also were included in Christ. So you became a follower in Christ. Watch this. When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Paul is saying to be a Christian means to believe in the truth, and the truth is the gospel. So Christianity is not, it doesn't start out by you doing something. It comes out by you hearing something. A message. That's why in Romans 10, 17, Paul would write, So faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard through the word of Christ. Literally, you know what the Greek means there in Romans 10, 17? Faith comes through hearing the message, and the message is Jesus. That's the gospel. The gospel is God so loved the world that God sent God's one and only Son. God so loved the world. That's, that's the gospel. See, I get a lot of people say uh, to me, you know, I, I, I don't believe in Christianity. And I'll say, well, tell me what Christianity is. And by the time they finish that, I go, I don't believe in that either. I, I mean, that's so <laughs> far removed from what Christianity is. Christianity is believing the gospel. Gospel, you've heard me preach before, was a literal term that was used outside of the Bible. It meant in that day and age an announcement of something that had happened in history. Something that was so important to change history. So when there were wars that were fought back in that day and age, the Romans or the Greeks or whatever, and the battle was won, people would run through the streets saying, gospel, gospel, good news, good news. Something has happened that's changed history. And that's what this is all about. The truth, Paul says, you've heard the message of the truth, and the truth is Jesus, that God actually really loves this world. 
and proves his love for us, and that on the cross of Jesus Christ, God was doing, willing to do whatever it took to rescue us. That's the gospel. That's the truth. See, and I don't have enough time. I could start talking about postmodernism. In fact, I wrote it in my notes, and I told Pastor Terry this morning, I said, look, if I preach that, people are going to be kicking dust out of their eyes. But the postmodern view was, and for good reason, sometimes you can't trust people who say they have the truth because we've seen a lot of oppression happen that way. So postmodernism began to say, no, we need to validate all voices. We need, we need to listen to all people, not just one group of people saying that we got the truth and we're shoving it down your nose. That's what happened in Nazi Germany. That's what happened during American slavery. Horrible things have happened, right? But the problem of postmodernism was what, what the consequence was, it was an unintended consequence, is everything is relative. There's no truth. It's all a matter of your opinion, right? That's why people sometimes will come to me as, you know, as a, as a theologian, whatever, say, well, you know, all religions are the same, which is not even close to being true, but that's the result, that everything is relative. But Paul said it's not relative of how God views the world. God proves his love for us in this way, Paul would write, that while we were yet sinners, while we were in darkness, while we were broken, God sent Jesus, and Jesus died for us. And this is the message of the truth. The gospel is Jesus really lived, he really died, and he really rose again. If you believe that, you're a follower of Christ. And so it isn't really, I know people get down on the weeds sometimes. I don't want to be a Christian because the, the Bible says I have to do this, I have to do that. Fine, yes, it says that. But do you believe he was raised from the dead? Because if you are, it will reshape your life. And it will change some things. Because the, being a Christian is not following rules. Being a Christian is following Jesus. It's following him. And that's the truth. And that's what Paul said to us. And that love is, you know, do you believe that kind of truth, that God so loved the world? Do you believe that Peter was preaching the truth when he said, you know, when in doubt, love one another, because love covers a multitude of sins? Do you believe when they asked Jesus, what does it mean to, what's the most important thing? He said, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and the other commandment is like it, which, which means in the Greek is equal, and love others the way you love yourself. See, that's truth. That's not relative. I was thinking about that when I read about some young sisters their names were Shreya and Saffron Patel, 16 and 18 years old. In 2020, they were disenfranchised from their grandparents because of COVID. They were unable to see their grandparents for well over a year. And they were, they were hurting over that. They were so close to their grandparents. So they would try to call them regularly. And one day, uh, uh, Saffron's uh, grandmother shared that she had just received a handwritten note from a friend of hers and how they're getting her such encouragement while they were in isolation. So these two teenagers said, wow, that sounds like a good ministry maybe, something we could do. So they called all the local care facilities in their area and, and uh, uh, care centers, and they said, would it be okay if we got the names of residents and we could write handwritten notes of encouragement? So a 16 and 18 year old wrote hundreds and hundreds of letters in the care facility. Well, word got out about that, and they realized that they, they couldn't continue to do this all over. So actually, they dubbed their collective letter writing effort, watch this, L-A-I, Letters Against Isolation. <laughs> and you know this took off? What started as two sisters writing letters, it's now grown to an award-winning nonprofit organization. And in the past two years, L-A-I has 28,000 volunteers now. Wow. And they've written 460,000 handwritten letters to folks living in assisted living in seven countries, the U.S., Canada, Ireland, England, Australia, South Africa, and Israel. That's truth. It's not relative. Truth is, people are lonely. Truth is, COVID worsened that. The truth is, the solution is still love. And Paul said, becoming a follower of Jesus Christ is believing the truth. And that's why when Jesus showed up, he said, I am the way and the truth, and the life. And look at the early church. They weren't denounced by the Roman government and, and persecuted because and told to denounce Jesus' teachings. They were told to denounce him. Being a Christian is not finally following the rules. Being a Christian is following Jesus. It's following him, believing the truth. 
believing in the gospel, believing in love. The second thing is hope. Christ, being a Christian is hope. To read in Ephesians 12, again, we who were the first, what? To put our hope in Christ. Now, it's very encouraging to me, people talk about hope, okay? Yeah, it's encouraging to me that biblical hope is way different than the way we throw hope around in the English. It's way different. In the English, we say things like this, God help us. We hope the Browns win today. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> Show you how much I've been paying attention. Go Cavs. Anyhow. Um, <laughs> we say things like that, right? I hope I'll get the promotion. I, like, I hope something happens. I'm not sure it's going to happen, but I really hope it's true. Do you know the Bible knows nothing of that definition of hope? In fact, the, the word in the Greek for hope literally means this. A life-shaping certainty about your future. That's the hope that Paul says. Do you realize human beings, we are hope-based creatures? Whatever we hope in will greatly affect our present. I, you know, don't believe me. I use a corny illustration, okay? Let's put two people... In, a, in an office with, you know, doing the same job, and it's hot and stuffy, and people are arguing. And to one person, they lean over and say, at the end of the day, we're going to pay you $50. And to the other person, they lean over and say, at the end of the day, we're going to pay you a million dollars. They're going to go through the same issues. and They're going to face them very differently. The one person's going to say, this one's hot, and these working conditions are terrible, and these people are mean. The other person's going to be whistling and zippity doo -dah. And, You know, yeah, it's hot and it's stuffy, and people are mean, but it's okay. Wow. Right? Because what we hope in affects our future. And the, the, the word, the one for that that gave me the, you know, the greatest illustration uh, was Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor, the great psychiatrist, passed away in 1997. But he chronicled a lot of what happened in the Holocaust and as a survivor. He wrote this famous book. It's, it's one of the best books I've ever written, Man's Search for Meaning. But in it, he talked about in the, in the, in the camps, in the death camps, the people that survived had a, had a certainty of hope. And the folks that lost hope just shriveled up in the corner and died. He said it was the only difference that one could measure. It was very interesting. Um, I read, and I just came across this. I didn't know this, but Viktor Frankl, after 1946, after he was liberated from the death camps, he gave lectures in Vienna, and uh, they were published in German, and you know, somebody in March of 2020 felt they'd be good for the world to hear, and they're now published in English, and I wish I'd have read them in March of 2020, but I read them recently, this past month, and it's entitled this, Yes to Life, in Spite of Everything. That's the title of his lectures after coming out of the death camps. Yes to life in spite of everything. And where that term came from is there was a song that they would sing in the camps at Buchenwald. They would sing a song. You know what it said? The words that said, whatever the future may hold, we want to say yes to life. Because one day the time will come. Then we will all be free. What power does it take to sing a song like that? The Bible says in a foreign land. In a place of death. And there was a daughter of a survivor in that book that was interviewed. And she said her parents had survived the death camps. But she said growing up in Boston, you would think people that went through that horror would be pessimistic. But instead, they would always gather, gather together. She said they'd get gussied up. I don't know what that means. I think it means get dressed up. But she said they would do that and they'd have these formal parties and they would celebrate. And they would celebrate life as a gift. And she said, my dad... Even the small things, a grandfather, a grandchild getting a Christmas gift, uh, somebody holding the door for somebody else uh, in need, he would say that living. See, hope in the scriptures is a sure certainty, a life-changing sure certainty, certainty about the future. That's why uh, I love the passage in Hebrews. And Hebrews, if you know, was written to a church now in oppression under the persecutions. You look at Hebrews and 1 Peter. I wrote about this in one of my e-notes a, a couple weeks ago. That's now the church facing persecution. So now the, the issue comes to how do we face it. And Hebrews says, we who have taken refuge might be strongly encouraged, what? 
to seize the hope set before us. And then this verse I return to again and again in my own life. It says, we have this hope, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. And if you've been around, you've heard me say, I've never been to the catacombs, but I have friends who have been there and a, a professor that was an archaeologist. And they said in the catacombs, those Christians who had died, died singing hymns as lions were bearing down on them, holding hands with their children as they were murdered in, in the Colosseum. It, that the, the symbol of Christ, yeah, there were some crosses. Yeah, there were some fish, the Isthmus. But the most common symbol of a Christian in the catacombs was an anchor. We have this hope. A sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. This story is too good. I have to tell it. I want to move on because I'm running out of time. But when I, I got my first boat when I was 16 years old, I grew up on the water. Uh, my dad uh, helped me purchase a boat. And, and because we did a lot of boating on Lake Erie and the Ohio River and things like that, we had a larger boat and a smaller boat. Um, my dad felt I was navigating when I was young, and he felt I needed to go get my power squadron trained. Um, this had just come out. It was brand new. The Coast Guard was doing it. Uh, captains were not required to do it before that time. So I went at 16 years old to power squadron training, and there was these old salt captains who had been on Lake Erie, man, for like 60 years. And they were kind of begrudgingly not wanting to go to this training. I mean, they're listening to 20-year-olds tell them how to navigate. I mean, they were like, son, I was navigating when you were born, you know? And I'll never forget, there was this old salt guy, and he was really cranky. And uh, finally, he had to get up in front of the, the examiner. And the examiner said, sir, he said, um, if you're out on Lake Erie, and a, a northeasterner comes in, and it hits you on the bow from the north, what do you do? He said, I get an anchor, and I throw it out to the north. Dummy. You know? And then, it, and then the guy got a little cranky with me. He goes, okay, so you have your anchor out the north, but another storm emerges on your starboard side, and it begins to hit you, uh, you know, from the east. What do you do? He said, I take another anchor out, and I throw it to the east. He said, okay, but what if a third storm comes up, and it hits you from the west? What are you going to do? He said, I'll throw a third anchor out to the west. He said, sir, I got a question for you. Where are you getting all these anchors? <laughs> I'll never forget, you know what that guy said? The same blankety-blank place you're getting all these storms. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the early Christians, man. Hit me from the north, the west, the east. Hit me with unfathomable storms. And I can even sing in Buchenwald, yes to life. Because I have a short and firm anchor of the soul. That's the hope. So what do we hope in? We hope in what the choir sang about. Not, not just singing heaven is sweet by and by. It's hope and glory. So truth and gospel, hope and glory. Here's Paul's verse. Read it again there. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of glory. Nine minutes. I'm going to take three minutes on each. One, possession. Two, inheritance. And three, oh, I'm sorry. P possession, inheritance. Two, redemption. And three, I don't know what three is. Um, <laughs> deposit. There it is. See, this is what happens when I hurry. First off, we're God's inheritance. We touched on this last week. It says we're God's most treasured possession. Do you think about that? I mean, God owns the stars. God made the universe. God made everything that's in it. And yet Paul says, to be a Christian, though, you're God's most treasured possession. Think about whatever, think about you have this inheritance. You have this uh, family heirloom, this bag of wonderful jewels. It's worth 75 times anything of, in your life. It's your greatest thing in net worth. And you're in an apartment building somewhere, and you're living in this little apartment, and you got that amazing treasure, and you sell smoke, and the fire alarms go off. What do you do? What do you grab? You grab your treasure and your iPhone, and you're fine. <laughs> right? You go, okay, you can buy furniture all this. The, Paul has the audacity to say, God looks at you that way, that you give God worth. 
Jesus, it says, for the joy that lay before him, Jesus endured the cross. We've got real worth, man. That's our treasure. That we're God's treasured possession. You know, and this is before, I love this. this, these words by Paul were written thousands of years before anybody talked about self-esteem. Nobody ever talked about self-esteem back then. Today, everybody talks about self-esteem, right? So I actually Googled some cures for self-esteem this past week. And here's what the, the great experts were saying about self-esteem. Here's the cure to get better self-esteem. One, think about your talents. Two, lose weight. Three, some of you love that. Three, <laughs> set, set some reachable goals and reach them. Four, spend more time doing what you really enjoy doing. Five, spend more time with people who really appreciate you. And six, pat yourself on the back. That's the world's cure to self-esteem. Wow. And how the heck does that measure up? To Ephesians 1.14. That said you are, the, you are the inheritance and treasure. Of the Lord of the universe. How dare we. You know stay up at night. Because somebody slighted us. How dare we hold grudges. About old things. And wonder if we measure up. When God says this. This is, this is, this is the first thing that we hope in. That, we, that we're God's treasured possession. Second thing. It's interesting there. It says, um, God has guaranteed our inheritance until the redemption. Until the redemption. What's that going on? I started thinking about that. That you're God's treasured possession and you're guaranteed a future with redemption. But wait a minute. Aren't we already redeemed? Didn't Jesus redeem us? Isn't that what we sing about? I've been redeemed, washed in the blood, you know, the old gospel song. So what, what does he say until that day of redemption and it hit me? That yes, we are redeemed in this life from past sin. But we're still under the power of sin. But there's a day coming. When everything will be set right. And even present sins will be gone. And the power of sin will be gone. And that's why Paul could say, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the what? The glory about to reveal to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. That one day all death, all decay, all suffering, all disease, all imperfection, everything wrong with you, everything wrong with me, Everything wrong with the world will be gone. It's like, I think it was Pippin, the little hobbit in Lord of the Rings, that after evil was defeated, he says to Gandalf the wizard, he said, are all the sad things becoming untrue? That's the glory that awaits us. It's not that the sad things will be erased. They just won't be true anymore. One of my mentors, Dr. Gerald Mann of Austin, Texas, I talked to him not long before he died. He wasn't in hospice. We didn't even know he was that ill. And I remember for whatever reason, I, he'd been long retired. And I said to him, Dr. Mann, what are you looking forward most to in heaven? Just a dumb young preacher question to an old veteran. And he said to me, you have to understand this question. His oldest daughter, Cindy, was born deaf, born without hearing. His wife, Lois, had contracted measles when she was pregnant with Cindy, and Cindy was born 100% deaf. This is way back when, before there was a lot of help for that. And as a struggling preacher out in Texas, yeah, he had a benefactor in the church that paid to send Cindy out to you know, the um, New England area to get treatment in the school for the deaf. She didn't handle it very well. She was separated from the family for a lot of years, and Cindy fell into extreme drug use and became addicted to drugs to this day. And uh, Cindy had a child herself. Dr. Mann and Lois had to sue for custody to raise their granddaughter. And his relationship with Cindy was fractured to the end of his life. And it was, he called it the pebble in my heart. He had several heart attacks and he felt it was all because he loved his daughter so much and, and life had estranged him from one another. Now that I've told you that story of Cindy, his deaf and drug addicted daughter, when I said to him, what are you most looking forward to in heaven? He said, I want to look at the, I want to see the look on Cindy's face the first time she hears the angels sing. Yeah. 
That's the glory. That's the redemption that's coming. All the sad things will be untrue. And last thing, the important thing. Paul said, you were marked with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit. Now what does deposit mean in the Greek? It means first installment. So it really hit me. We're not just, this is where Karl Marx was wrong. We're just not waiting for heaven in the sweet by and by. We've got some of heaven now. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is in you. It is with you. And when we, when we believe in the truth of the gospel, that God so loved the world, and when we cling to the hope as a life-changing reality, and we follow Jesus, there's a deposit of the Holy Spirit in us. It's a first installment of the things that are to come. And I don't think we realize how life-changing that can be. It can, it can totally revolutionize your life. Yeah. Take it from me. Honestly, I, I was a revenge kind of guy. I really was before I, I came to Christ. You get me, I'm going to get you. I'm from Youngstown, for heaven's sake. You know, we, we don't do the cushy Akron stuff, man. We, 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 we go after it, right? And, and you know, when the Holy Spirit came into my life, it revolutionized my life. It changed my world. I wasn't going to tell you this story. I got to, oh my God, I'm so glad my wife isn't here. I shouldn't tell you the story. Should I tell you the story? All right, say, true story. I had come to Christ, and Terry and I were engaged. Um, she had been a big vehicle for getting me back to Christ and to God. But I was just changing, right? And so um, I was uh, selling products in the construction industry. So uh, I had to go to contractors' bars at night to write orders. Terry hated it, because most of them were country western out in the middle of the foot. So there was, a, there, was a, there was a bar called Bucko's. It was in North Lima, Ohio. And Terry and I had to go there. The owner of that bar was um, a customer. And I had a big water or pipeline order, I had to write. And we went there. And, and uh, you know, Terry was the first African American woman to walk into Buckos in North Lima. You, you could tell. And people were visibly uncomfortable with us. And so uh, Blitz was his name. He, he got a call. He said, Chip, I'm writing a purchase order. He said, Everything's on my tab. You and Terry finish eating. I got to get out of here. So he left. And when the owner left who was sitting with us, the crowd became a little rambunctious. And there was a brother there. You know, he had a wonderful little flag on his head. It was not the American flag. It was the, the ones that tried to overthrow America. Remember those guys down south? And uh, he was grumbling and growling. I'm trying to get out of there. Well, he, um, he got up. And so I have to go to the bathroom. He shoved his chair back and slammed into Terry's chair. And I told my wife to go to the car. And she knew the pre-Christian chip. <laughs> and she said, no, I'm not going to Christ. Go to the car now. My wife went out there into our little SUV, and she, true story, don't tell her I told you this. She took her phone, you know when the phones were wired to the car? My kids still don't believe that happened. <laughs> and she dialed 911, and she was ready to hit send. And I got in this brother's face, nose to nose. And I said to him, I'm, I'm literally trembling because I wanted to, wanted to do something that Jesus did not want me to do. But I said to him, true story, I said, do you know Jesus? He said, do you know Jesus? I don't have to know Jesus. I, like, I said, get to know him. He said, why? I said, because he just saved your life. <laughs> <laughs> and I walked out of that place, and my wife was so proud of me. I beat up the dashboard, I'll tell you that. That is a true story. I'm not putting hair on it. But I tell you that to tell you this. This kind of hope, this kind of deposit, the Holy Spirit of God, not just future glory, but some of that future glory now, it can revolutionize you. It revolutionized me. And that's why Paul would later say, greater is the one who is in you than the one who is in the world. May God who has begun a good work I'm never going to live this one down. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I hear Miss Francis giggling. I'm going to hear this one for the next 10 years. May God has begun a good work in you, perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. And Paul could say to Timothy, stir up the gifts of God that are in you. This is the deposit that's in you. For God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind.
And at the end of Ephesians, Paul would say, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ask or think, according to what? The power, the Holy Spirit that's in us. I hope that activates in you, and I hope you will forgive me for telling that story. It wasn't in my notes. <laughs> now I feel like I got to tell Mosaic because they'll feel cheated. <laughs> All right, let's pray together. God, um, we give you thanks for reminding us. We sang to begin this service. We want to be more Christian in our heart. We want to be more loving in our heart. We want to be like you, Jesus, in our heart. Help us to know that being a Christian means believing the truth. And the, the truth of the message is you. That you, God so loved us that you came and demonstrated your love for us. That we would seize this hope that, oh my gosh, they could sing about in Buchenwald and we have trouble singing about in our kitchen. God, give us that sure and certain hope, that anchor for the soul. And help us to know we're anchored in glory of being your treasured possession. Of knowing that there's a day of total redemption. And knowing some of that day, some of that future glory is in us now as we follow you with the presence of the Holy Spirit living in us. Jesus, how much would we change if we really believe that? Help us to believe it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing as we close. last phrase in the song I think summed it up so beautifully. Though our bodies they may kill this truth abideth still God's kingdom endures forever. My prayer this week is that God would bless each of us here gathered in this place each person worshiping with us online with that, that knowledge deep in our spirit, souls and bodies that no matter what's been done to us, no matter what we have done, 
that we have this unshakable in Jesus Christ, that we follow not a dead historical figure, but we follow a living Savior who has placed his spirit within us and among us. We, his precious possessions, go and live in that unshakable hope today and every day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.